I want to move on to our next talk. I think I was thinking about how do I think about doing really good segues and transitions into how we change themes or topics, but it turns out that everybody's just automatically making it easy for me by already setting up uh, what the next talk should be about. So um, Gary just talked about what this actually means in a social context and how do we actually get people to care in its scale. And uh, this kind of brings up for, for our next talk. So I want to really, I'm super excited to welcome Dylan Field from Figma and Tubador from uh, Metaverse to really kind of share their opinions on some of the recent events that have happened in this space. Um, we're going to be talking about at a high level what the value of NFTs are um, or is. And, uh, and there's a lot of things going on here. So We'll see whatever we can fit into this ecosystem and, and in the next 30 minutes. And uh, without further ado, let's kick off this incredible talk. So we have Dylan and Tubador. Um, thank you so much for uh, for joining us. Um, not only is it amazing to have you from both of your respective communities, but it's also an honor to uh, do our uh, summit with this anonymous person. Um, this is kind of the world that we uh, are jumping into and that kind of excites me a lot more because this is new to a bunch of us and just uh, just great. So welcome. And what I want to do is I want to just ask each of you uh, to introduce yourself and just kind of give us some context into how you got into crypto and NFTs. And I'll start maybe with Dylan. Yeah, well, Kartik, first of all, thanks for having me. And uh, I'm really excited for this this conversation. Um, how I got into crypto, uh, I had been really interested in cryptography uh, in middle school and high school. Um, and I'd done some like lectures online about uh, hash functions and people had been reaching out to me like, like in the very early days of Bitcoin about about crypto. Unfortunately, I didn't. Uh, I thought they were insane and so I ignored the messages. Uh, and then I joined the TL Fellowship community. And as a TL Fellow, people were really excited about crypto as well. And I also thought they were insane. And so it took me a few revs to get to the point where you know I started to get very interested and very involved in the crypto community. Um, and that's, I think, why I flipped all the harder when I finally did. Uh, in my my day job, I uh, at, at my night job, to be fair, I'm CEO and co-founder of Figma, and uh, I really care about uh, how to make it so that everyone is able to be creative and how to make it so that more people are able to participate in the digital economy. Uh, and I think that crypto and NFTs and Figma, to me, kind of all go under the same umbrella in terms of like how do you enable creativity and how do you enable uh, sovereignty and, and abundance and um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to discuss today. Thank you. Um, no, I was with Dylan uh, on a clubhouse chat, the Good Time show with uh, RT and Sriram. I should have learned my lesson then. This guy is a tough act to follow uh, in under any circumstance. <laughs> so I should have gone first. And uh, uh, Karthik, I'm not a pseudonym. It's just that I look exactly like my avatar. It's totally fair. So what you see on the screen is <laughs> what you see is what you get. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, uh, I, I love telling the story of how I got into this space and uh, uh, only recently because it it says very different things to different people, right? If, if you're a left brain person, my story feels like uh, a series of lost opportunities and finally finding your group. But for a right brain person, he thinks, oh, wow, okay, I can skip the first three years of this guy's crypto life and jump straight into the NFT space because that's what it allows. That, that That's practically my story. I uh, I was introduced to crypto by Meta Coven, who was uh, an app developer and a serial entrepreneur already. And uh, uh, so at, at the first conversation we had, he spoke about Bitcoin. Uh, he used a lot of words. I understood all of those words uh, individually. But I had no idea what he was talking about. And we didn't speak for the next three years. And that might have been on purpose <laughs> in some sense. But uh, a few years later, some somewhere in uh, 2016, he had a couple of uh, enterprises under his belt. He'd uh, uh, you know, um, uh, done escrow services. He, uh, he'd installed like 100 uh, Bitcoin ATMs all over the world. And then he came back and said, let's do Android. And so I jumped on that uh, ship. So I did DeFi for a few years with uh, uh, Vignesh. But then uh, during the pandemic, it sort of pushed all of us inward into the metaverse. And that's when I truly discovered, uh, I mean, uh, like Gary, we put it, right? It, it, Sometimes NFTs, when you interact with them, they feel like, okay, you found your life's purpose in some sense. And that's, that's not because of any, um, uh, how do I say, it, it is actually quite profound. It's because NFTs are experience at the end of it. And you start to feel them and they're so vivid and they're so real. And me, I'm a wordsmith for a living. I write for a living, I communicate for a living. Finally, I was able to sort of start talking in color, start communicating in color, and that, really blew my mind. I was able to connect with people. And this 
pseudonym that you see in uh, front of you. It sort of uh, dropped into that space without any baggage, with just uh, a whole bunch of uh, metaverse to explore. And that's that's when the metaverse journey also started. So long story short, for left brain people, uh, a bunch of lost opportunities and finally finding you Google. Right brain people take note. If you want to jump into crypto, start with the NFTs, <laughs> skip the rest. No, that's an amazing intro. And, uh, and maybe, so I had a bunch of questions prepared, but I feel like I'm going to have to just throw a bunch of that out of the window because there's just going to be a lot more just things that will yeah. come from, from your answer. So we'll just dig in and, and go into it directly. So what I'll do is I want to start off with actually uh, with YouTube Ador. So Medicov and yourself uh, made a, a bit of news um, a couple of weeks ago by uh, buying and winning the uh, Beeple's uh, 5,000 days uh for the first 5,000 days artwork uh, and purchasing it for uh, a little over $69 million. Um, I actually want, yeah. want to understand and want um, the audience watching to you a little bit kind of hear about how you actually made that decision to sort of get into this. Uh, you've talked about uh, being a fan of people for uh, not just from a few weeks ago, but from uh, late mm -hmm. last year. Um, just walk us through what made you interested in, in his work, um, how you decided to think about owning that as, as our piece and how that historic moment altogether just came to be from, from your side. Wow, okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess I did see a few tweets on my timeline about that, so a bit of news. Um, you know, uh, uh, Metacovin and I, we, uh, Metapurse was like, a, uh, it's sort of a coalescence of both of our theses about the NFT space. That fellow uh, has been collecting NFTs, culturally and uh, uh, culturally significant NFTs since uh, early 2017. He started with Decentraland. Uh, he's now the largest estate owner, single estate owner in Decentraland. He has the Delta Time Triple One. He has the first supper on Async Art, which is the first work of programmable art. He has an Urbit Galaxy and, and so on and so forth, right? He's been collecting for a while. But then somewhere down the line, uh, uh, around uh, March, April, May, when I started to sort of uh, interact with the creators and the artists in the space, our thesis about NFTs being this this catalyst, this touchstone for everything crypto started to converge. And that's how Metaverse was uh, born. So after a while, we, when we started to uh, think about this thesis, how do we power this, uh, you know, this engine that we have of, uh, uh, you know, NFTs? How do we take it to the next level uh, out of the blue? And this is where serendipity works in, uh, in crypto, right? People reached out to Metaco. Out of the blue. And he said, uh, hey, man, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. Uh, are you interested? And the weirdest part is that uh, people reached out because uh, Metacoven was a losing bidder in his first uh, Nifty Gateway auction. He didn't get the piece. <laughs> that one went for, I think, $60,000 or something. And uh, Metacoven lost that bid. And he just reached out as a whole. And then it clicked. So the shift here was two things. One, uh, the thesis that uh, the future of the NFT space depends on creating experiences around these NFTs. The Cambrian explosion that we're seeing right now is only the acquisition phase, right? People are uh, gobbling up NFTs, trying to acquire them. But the real explosion will occur when these NFTs finally start to uh, be experienced uh, in a manner that they were meant to be. And that's where we wanted to go with this. So uh, we decided to buy all 20 of uh, people's single edition pieces. Uh, that, that's, that's a whole other story, but, but we did that. And then we created these massive monuments across the metaverse in Decentraland, crypto voxels. We called it the B20 project. It's, it's still there. So we bundled all of these 20 pieces. We bundled these monuments. We bundled an original soundscape by Blau and we fractionalized the ownership into the B20 tokens. So, why Beeple is an easier question to answer because we believe he's the artist of our generation. We believe that he represents the only thing that is unhackable in this digital world and that is time. And that's what this Beeple 5000 represents, right? Think about it. Every day, for 5000 plus days, he sat down and done this one thing. It just blows your mind. And that sort of consistency, almost spiritual level of consistency and creating for the sake of creating is... Uh, plus, <laughs> the beauty of it is if you start at uh, the 5,000 uh, piece at the top left, the first picture is absolute crap. Uh, I mean, people level absolute crap. And then you graduate all the way. You see the journey of an artist, how he's grown as an artist and how he was able to do these things at the most crucial times in his life, right? Uh, I remember a story where uh, he, he did one in 15 minutes because his wife was in labor. He didn't miss even that day. So this this... 
this collage or this con- this thing represents uh, a person's life 13 years of commitment to this one thing and that's why we believe he's the artist of the generation and that's why we also believe uh, in retrospect that we got it for the steel that is a absolutely wonderful um perspective on how you're thinking about this and and, and i absolutely agree this is a snapshot of uh, the 13 years of the progress of who people is now and i'm sure we'll be extremely happy to hear that and and uh and uh, I feel like now Dylan is the, the act that, uh, you're the act that Dylan has to follow. <laughs> so um, it wasn't just uh, Medikovin and yourself that made some news. Uh, Dylan, you also made a yep. little bit of news uh, with uh, the, the recent sell of uh, CryptoPunk 7804. Um, I want to actually have you just talk about what CryptoPunks are, um, just talk about some sure. of the, the traits of scarcity and describe uh, 7804. Yeah, um, so CryptoPunks were the first Ethereum crypto art project, and they were created in 2017 as well, uh, which is around the same time probably that Medikovin and uh, Tubador were, were checking out Decentraland, because I remember checking it out at the same time. And uh, <laughs> right. uh, okay. it, it, that's another topic. I, I'm very curious to talk about Metaverse later if we have the time, but the, um, uh, yeah. they were created by these two artists, Matt Hall and John Watkinson. And there are only 10,000 CryptoPunks and they were actually available for anyone to claim at the start. And unfortunately I did not claim them then, but, uh, uh, but yeah, anyone can claim them for free in the early days, which I thought was a really cool and pure way to distribute them to the community. And then from there, a market formed and um, different people were training them based on rarity. Uh, of the 10,000 CryptoPunks, there were only 88 zombie punks. There were 24 apes and there were nine aliens and there was exactly one alien uh, punk that was smoking a pipe and its name is 7804. And I found 7804 to be completely magnetic and uh, I was obsessed with it, honestly. And I, over the holidays um, uh, of 2017, 2018, um, I, I started to think seriously. I was on a trip with my then girlfriend, now wife, Elena, uh, who's also amazing in, in the early NFT space and now working in privacy in the crypto space. And um, uh, and we started talking about it and I said, I think I'm going to, this might be the craziest thing I've ever done, but I'm going to put down $15,000 as a bid for 7804. Cause I think this could be the digital Mona Lisa. And, uh, and sorry, this is 2018, correct? Yeah. This is January, early January of 2018 now. And, um, and I had bought a few already, but this is the one that I coveted and, and care about the most and had most of a relationship with. And it's just, I thought a very iconic image and, um, and so the, the big guy accepted, uh, and yeah, I, 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 uh, I told some people when I first came back uh, from this trip and their reaction was that I was crazy. Uh, and, you know, I think that, you know, it's amazing how in three years, how much, so much has changed about the way that we interpret and understand the internet and digital ownership and art. Um, but, uh, at that time, you know, people just totally didn't get it. And so I was a little quiet for a few years. Um, cause I was like, oh, maybe I, you know, this is not the right time. I'll talk about this another time. And then um, over the last six months, I started to get more loud. I put it in my avatar. I started to really talk about it more with people. And um, I, 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 over the entire period of time, when it was kind of a secret entity, as well as when it was a public identity, I really felt a relationship with the art piece uh, in a way that was, um, I, I, I never expected. And I think going through the process of selling it, which I, I, um, I was very mixed about, but I thought ultimately that if this is going to be the digital Mona Lisa, it has to change hands. It has to actually be recognized with value by somebody else. Um, and uh, of course I was conflicted because I loved it so much, but I, um, I, I think through the process of selling it, I've actually believed even more uh, that all the conversations and questions about like, are NFTs art? Uh, can you have a relationship with digital objects? Uh, those are just now so clear to me because I think the answers are sounding yes. Like not all NFTs are art, uh, but art can be NFTs and you can have a relationship with that art when it's digital. And uh, that makes me so bullish on the future of the NFT industry um, because I think that there's, it's not only art, but I also think that when you start thinking about what does it mean to have a relationship with digital space and items, there's just so much that, that could unfold there. Uh, and, and as we think about the metaverse, whether it's Decentraland, whether it's Gather Town, centralized, decentralized, um, or, or a meeting between the two worlds, I think that there's going to be um, relationships that form, there's going to be objects that are created, 
uh, we're, we're going to go from sort of this, this, if you look at the way that the economy develops from currency to goods to services, we're going to see the exact same thing happen in the metaverse. And that's fascinating to me. And the crypto um, implications for that are so vast and, and just so wild that I'm really excited to see what the next 10 years brings. No, it's absolutely amazing. I think uh, um, you said this, uh, I believe in a tweet or, or another, uh, was it the clubhouse where uh, you said owning seven out of four was a, a curse as, as well. And uh, it's, it's just the exact same thing you talked about. There's an emotional relationship that, uh, that you have with this, uh, this piece and you've had it for a few years, that's part of your identity and for it to be successful and really propagate the message of this actually is a new way to think about art, um, you have to part ways. And uh, that's right. I think- And uh, you'll have always part ways with the Mona Lisa. Uh, that'll <laughs> never be a part of my identity as well now, but I'm, I've signed up for that and that's okay with me. Cause I, I uh, it's not the, the money that motivates me. I, you know, money is nice and don't get me wrong, but um, it's a very privileged thing to say that, but, uh, but at the same time, I, I care so much more about, can we make this a movement? And can we make this something where creators, uh, I, I see NFTs as a way for creators to have room to explore their art. Uh, you know, going back to what Tubidor said, you know, time is the only thing that's unhackable. I think it's a beautiful statement. Uh, and uh, Medikovan said that, I, I keep oh, uh, quoting. But Medikovan, but <laughs> uh, either way, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful statement. And yeah. I think that, uh, you know, time is also so scarce and, you know, money can equal time. Um, if you have income, that will give you time to work on whatever you care about most. And to the degree that NFTs can create that space for people, create that abundance for people, uh, I think the world can really change as a result. Absolutely agree. And, and um, I, I guess you already bring that, brought that up and I was going to ask you to Bador, um, let's kind of dig a bit into how you think about uh, Metaverse and just uh, the Metaverse overall. Uh, could you give us an overview of what Metaverse is, um, what led to its creation as as an entity, or I would say, or as an org, and uh, and also you kind of just talked about the the B twenty project, but uh, would love to kind of have our audience know a bit more detail about what that was, how it was set up, and uh, and uh, what were uh, what you expected for people to kind of do and interact with. Yeah, beautiful. Um, B twenty project was uh, um, you know uh, it was done at a massive scale and. Uh, one of the reasons we did it was because it was like trying to put together the first computer or the first car, right? You don't know how all the parts fit. So it necessarily has to be big to, to see if that thesis worked. So which is why we needed something as uh, um, spectacular as the 2020 uh, one of ones of people in massive, massive uh, estates in Decentraland, CryptoVoxel, Somnium Space and so on. And we had what was called the Metapalooza which turned out to be the largest ever virtual event in the crypto space. Uh, I mean, the thing is, beyond a certain point, uh, Metaverse can't take credit for any of it. Because, I mean, if, I, say, uh, uh, 500, 600 people turn up, fine, I, I'll take some credit. Uh, you know, nifty turn of phrase, great design, and all of that stuff. When 2,500 to 3,000 people turn up for an event, he said, okay, somebody else took charge of this. Nobody told me uh, about it. So that, that's, that's kind of what happened. It means that uh, people were ready for uh, a certain uh, shift in the way they looked at art and engaged with it. And that was at the heart of the B20 uh, movement in a sense. And Andrew Steinwald described it best for us. It was the first public art project uh, uh, in a sense. It was like the virtual uh, MoMA with the only difference that you can now own a piece of the museum as well. So when you walk into the Museum of Modern Art and you have this visceral connection with one of those art pieces, all we did was to tokenize that connection. Say, I, I own the entire experience, right from the step that I walk into to this space, to the sound that I hear, to the experience that I have in the art. And that's uh, that's simply what the B20 token represents, right? It's, it's very simple. It's not uh, a utility token. It's not a social token. Uh, there's no protocol behind it. There's no roadmap. It just means that it gives you a piece of the ownership of that. And whether or not you have B20s, you can walk into those museums today and experience those works of art. The paradigm we wanted to shift, like I was uh, talking about, was the, the way the world engages with art is, is very unimaginative. You either buy it and flip it for a higher price, or you buy it and lock it away somewhere, which is what happens to conventional pieces. The third part is, is what we tried with B20, which is to open up access to the entire world. That used to be how art worked in ancient temples in India or Egypt or in Rome, ancient civilizations. That's how art was experienced. But then um, a layer of uh, uh, 
finance sort of settled on it, it stopped being sustainable. And B20 changed that. It's now sustainable and sort of profitable for all of the stakeholders as well. And the moment we realized that was when we worked with 30 people, right, uh, uh, to build B20. We worked with uh, Whale Street, the team at Whale Street, which did the, uh, you know, the underlying tech work. They did the bundling and the fractionalizing. Now, credit to uh, uh, NFDX and NIFTEX, who have been doing it for quite a while now. Uh, this is not an original idea. This is not a new idea. We just did it at a different scale. That's all. Uh, Whale Street did that. We have uh, Metacast, which is a team of uh, excellent communicators uh, like Andrew Steinwald, uh, Matthew from Scent, Brooke, and so on. Uh, we had Grow Your Base, which helped us with the tokenomics of the whole thing. So about 30 people in all, right? And all of them chose to take B20s instead of uh, USDC or ETH. That's when we realized, oh, okay, this they actually believe in this idea. It's not just us. And so uh, it, it was very heartening to see also uh, a community sort of form uh, quite naturally and spontaneously around B20. Uh, there, there is no official Discord for Metaverse. We never created a, a B20 Discord, but now three Discords exist. There's one uh, very graciously created by the whale community. There's one um, you know, uh, by, uh, by fans elsewhere, and there's one as part of uh, Whale Street. So all of this is the uh, B20 story. And, and this sort of... Uh, confidence that this this uh, this enabled in us is what you know spurred us towards bringing home the people 5000 as well if if anybody ought to have that piece it should be someone uh, from the crypto space preferably not just in some so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, i am I think, happy to hear that <laughs> i thought what you're saying tibdor i think one of the, the things i've been reflecting on a lot recently is how the question of what is art has always propelled art forward. And obviously that's getting pulled into question even more with NFTs and, and uh, when people see, whether it's people seeing people and going, okay, it's not what I traditionally think of as art or as people saying is the format and has changed. Um, I, I also think that there's inherent link in crypto. And I think you, you highlighted it beautifully of art as community and that being a part right. of the artwork. And, uh, and I think you're, it, it was fascinating just to hear you say about how this parallels uh, ancient civilizations as well, where art was also community and uh, and part of the community in a different way. And so I think there's so much to explore there, uh, whether it's DAOs uh, uh, being able to mint things or uh, vote on how art should change over time, uh, whether it's sort of communities coming together to experience art. I mean, there's just so much there uh, and I'm really eager to see how it evolves too. Yeah. I was gonna say, yeah, I, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, just uh, 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 emphatically agreeing with Dylan, that's all. <laughs> um, no, it's actually very much true, because what I was going to ask was, like, this definitely changes some definition of what art is, uh, because we've not uh, had to update that definition uh, for the digital world. I mean, it's, it's kind of stayed constant uh, for, for the last few decades, ever since we've uh, gotten computers and internet to be, uh, to be widespread and mainstream, but also until we kind of had a notion of scarcity, uh, whether that's verifiability or, or decentralization or anything else, um, we've never been able to actually get the digital version of the same art to explode or actually be equally valuable or considered valuable. Um, so I was actually curious to hear both of your thoughts on, um, obviously NFTs is, is not just art and, and uh, it's a much bigger realm. Um, you hinted about being DAOs and communities and, and having much more anywhere from tokenization or fractionalization of these things. But how do you think about programmability, uh, programmability in, in the digital world? Like we have smart contracts that can create dynamic pieces. We have a lot of way to think about um, what creativity is. Um, what excites you in, in sort of that realm? Do you want to start? No, no, I'll, I'll let you go. Okay. Um, I think in the broader NFT realm, I, again, I think like this framework of thinking about the digital economy is moving from currency to goods to services is something I'm thinking about a lot right now. And uh, I, I think that uh, if you think about goods, um, having there's just so much that could be tokenized. And, uh, and of course, there's the question of like, what is the advantage that being tokenized gives? So the advantage that tokenizing a piece of art gives to the creator of the art is that they can monetize the art in a different way, but they can also bring their community together. And as if people have the financial incentives to grow the community, the artists will then take off even more. Um, I think that 
Another thing that I get excited about is sort of how do you create productive assets as NFTs? So for example, music rights would be an example there. Now I'm not saying AK comment legally or uh, anything about like security, not security, but I think that that aside, if you think about a music right uh, being tokenized combined with fractionalization, um, mm. you can start to get to, to actual dividend streams. Uh, and I think that plus some of the things we're seeing with services like Uniswap, where um, that, which might eventually come actually create dividends. Um, crypto is then looking like not a speculative, you know, gambling house, but rather it looks like an economy. And I think like we are in that transition right now uh, to that final state. As it happens, then I think that the boom and the bust cycles become a little bit less severe and crypto starts to grow in a more predictable way. And it gets a lot more interesting very fast. Um, and I think that the, the bigger trend that the world is going through right now, even outside of crypto, is that we're going from a physical world to digital world. And COVID has accelerated this by like a decade. Uh, and our entire economy is going digital. And we're seeing this in Figma all the time um, because all of our customers are, are these traditional shops that have gone from, I create a physical product to like, I have to actually figure out what that means in the digital world. And um, I, I think as, as we get more digital, it makes sense to have currency and to have an economy that's also digital and NFTs will be a critical part of that. Dylan, that was incredibly layered actually. I saw like three very distinct layers all based on uh, the, 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 the aspect of programmability. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. One layer that you described was the experience layer, right? So what the mm -hmm. NFT space lacks right now and what a lot of people are trying to build is this consumption stream. How do I consume an NFT? Uh, instead of just buying it and acquiring it. So that's where the first layer of, uh, you know, programmability comes in. That's that's one of the things you solve by, uh, uh, say, creating immersive experiences, for instance, or 360 degree art, or, you know, uh, monuments like B20, which you go into. The second part is to, uh, of programmability, is to be able to transfer or share an experience without having to transfer ownership of an asset. Uh, just a fancy way of saying uh, I should be able to rent or lease my NFT in an effective manner without having to, you know, transfer ownership of it. Uh, um, so that's that's sort of uh, already uh, uh, many experiments around that. And the obvious use case is land, of course, but uh, there have been uh, other uses too, uh, which brings us to the third layer of what you spoke about. For these two things to happen, you need interoperability across, uh, you know, different uh, um spheres of experience, different metaverses. And that's when the actual metaverse sort of happens. So you create a consumption stream first, and then you create this ownership layer without having to transfer ownership, just the experience, and then interoperability that connects all of these things together. And then the metaverse is truly born. I love it. That's a great... Uh, yeah, I can't wait to get with you more on the metaverse. This is going to be so <laughs> I mean, talk about it. You, you said it, man. I just paraphrased it. <laughs> <laughs> I think what's even more interesting is uh, um, the way I kind of understood this is these are not explicit distinctions between one or the other layer. All these three are also self-consistent with each of the other layers because you can have this programmability also apply on the sharing, um, on the um, on the uh, the collaboration of it to generate uh, this piece and also on like what it means to make this productive. Mm -hmm. So uh, all these things are also intercompatible and, and that's what's exciting because now the surface area of what was possible is, is exponentially bigger. Um, so that to me is, I think the, the most interesting piece because uh, there's over 500 people working on cool things with NFCs and they're mm -hmm. going to be looking at applying programming to, to create art. And, uh, and that excites wow. me. <laughs> Um, so I also want to kind of just have, um, maybe, uh, we want to wrap this up. I, I wish we could go longer because uh, there's so many things that we can dig into and we'll maybe just, this was an action item for us to do where we're going to have a much longer conversation, uh, in the future. But, um, how do you kind of think about, uh, essentially what we need to do to make more artists and, um, creative folks, developers, get into this, uh, this ecosystem uh, more. Any advice, Dylan, you've obviously inspired a whole generation of designers uh, and, and with Figma, uh, Tubador and Metacoven, you've brought this on from the crypto first side and inspired that, that created the whole, um, I would say the industry on how big uh, this 
uh, this sector can be. Um, how do you kind of think about getting more people in? What should they be thinking about if they're looking to get into the space? And overall, like, what can they do if they want to be more involved? Yeah, uh, I think there's a few different parts to that. So first of all, I think like there's an opportunity to create technology that is not as complex as, as crypto typically is. Uh, there's no reason why it has to be as complex as it is today. No reason why when you send a, a transaction, it has to be so scary. Uh, you know, um, I think that there's huge UX improvements we can make to the ecosystem, ecosystem and that'll help bring people that are not as not as technical into the ecosystem. Uh, I, I also think that the, the ultimate thing we can do to make it so that more people can experience this is scalability. Uh, when you have, it costs $50 to mint an NFT or more, uh, you're going to limit the set of people that can do that. And so uh, I'm excited to see the Ethereum community invest so much in layer in, in, uh, in E2 as well as other layer twos. And um, yeah, I'm really hopeful for, for what will end up there. Nice. Um, um, I guess one of the powerful tools in trying to bring people inside and what Dylan just described uh, is uh, more uh, creating a welcome atmosphere once people sort of start looking this way. Whereas most of the attention we get right now is around uh, uh, the price tag of uh, NFTs that get sold typically. Nothing wrong with that. Obviously, 69 million is a big number. It does attract eyeballs. But the other thing we thought uh, we could do is to try and tell effective stories, right? So one of the things we've done right after uh, uh, the Christie's auction, while we were trying to process all of it, is to announce this grant of $500,000, 100,000 for uh, one storyteller, it can be a writer, a videographer, a filmmaker, whatever your medium is, split over 12 month stipends. There are amazing stories in the metaverse, like Karthik just described, 500 people, working on uh, incredibly uh, diverse things to build in the metaverse. So those stories need to be told. And I think those can be powerful magnets for uh, you know technical people who will want to become part of those stories to build and also to uh, right-brained uh, um, idiots like me who, who just uh, look at bright blinking colors and <laughs> are attracted and come to the space. And we need a bit of both, right? So uh, I think telling these stories uh, effectively and uh, uh, with a conscience uh, will, will make a lot of difference in, in trying to bring people as well. That's, uh, that's well put. I, I think uh, just for everybody listening on this, and uh, we'll actually, uh, we'll make sure we uh, advertise this on, on the event Discord too, but uh, MetaFirst.Fund um, just announced uh, the fellowship where they were going to be giving $100,000 to five uh, folks and, uh, and talk in demonstrating their stories and how they can actually make this uh, space uh, a lot bigger and more inspiring. So um, that's a really good, I think that's a really good way to end this. Um, what we'll do is, uh, I mean, I, the, the best thing about like, we've been doing events for, for years. The, the best thing that kind of gets me excited every time is that I know who's participating, but I don't know what's gonna come out of it. And I won't know until everybody else at that same time. So 48 hours from now is when we see exactly what comes out and it's gonna blow our minds. Uh, three years ago, when we started ETH Global, uh, we saw the birth of CryptoKitties. And, uh, and if I kind of think about uh, sort of summarizing what's happened in the past, uh, a, a developer hackathon from 2017, um, and now we're doing an event entirely on an industry that came out of a project from that event is to me a really good way to talk about and think about what it means uh, when new industries get popped up through the, the benefit of technology. So um, I am super excited to see what comes out of it. We'll be sure to tell both of you what also came out of this event and uh, hopefully we'll get you a lot more involved in the future events. So with that, Dylan, Tubador, thank you so much for giving us your time today. And- uh, Thank you, Kartik. We're glad Thanks, Kartik. Thank you. Thanks, Dylan. Can't wait to see what comes out of this event. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I did. Yeah. Amazing. So, Thanks. Guys.